Okay, guys, I'm going to quickly get on. I'm going to whiz through this as quickly as I can. Um, so you've got your prescribing exam coming up as well as finals to think about. So this, exact, this lecture tries to just touch on um, kind of both of those exams for you. Um, when I initially made it in 2014, this was the outline I gave. Um, and there was a lot of kind of theory-based stuff about prescribing. In light of the prescribing exam, I've kind of altered it a bit, and it's trying to focus much more on the, the structures that they, they give you in that. Um, so hopefully you've all seen this. This is the kind of outline of the prescribing exam you're going to be sitting. Um, the things in green are the things I'm going to try and touch on today. Um, the th these bottom three are things that are covered in other lectures. So obviously providing information will come through all the different lectures and the communication skills. The calculation skills will be done in Will's um, specific calculation lecture. Planning management is obviously all of the specialists in thinking about how you treat conditions. But we're going to whiz through some of these things, some examples to think about. Yeah. And when's the Warfarin lecture? The lecture is going to be on the 10th of February. Sorry, it's, we can't fit all of the prescribing type stuff before the prescribing exam. Um, but, sorry, yeah, that will be on the 10th of February. Um, and this does come up not only, in, obviously, in your PSA, um, but in the OSCEs and the written. You know, in my OSCE, I was given a drug chart. I was asked to prescribe medications. I was then given another drug chart and asked to highlight some of the mistakes on that prescription. So the stuff I'm doing today does come up. Um, so all the theory about prescribing is at the end of the lecture, which you can look at later. Something that does trip people up is prescribing controlled drugs. Um, so, you know, things like morphine, um, certain benzodiazepines. A lot of this is just kind of the standard stuff that would be relevant for all um, prescriptions. So ensuring that you have the name and address of the patient, the name and strength of the formulation that you're given, the dose and frequency. The thing that separates controlled drugs from others is the the stating the total amount to be supplied in words and figures. So this is more kind of when you're discharging a patient home, FP10s, TTAs and things. It's the total amount that you want the pharmacist to give that patient to take away with them that you need to specify in words and figures. BNFA also puts in this more philosophical stuff that we all have a duty to not prescribe these unnecessarily for patients because of the addiction. So we're sending Malcolm Fish home from hospital. Um, which of these is correct? One on the left. Hands up for the one on the left. For the one on the right. No, some of you are sitting on the fence. Um, so it is the one on the left because it's the total amount that you want to give them that you need to write in the words and figures. So you've got the, the name of the medication, the strength, the formulation, um, and you want them to give 28 tablets. So you don't need to put the 10 milligram in capitals. Another example, so... Um, a, a liquid morphine, such as oromorphia, which is right? One on the left? One on the right? Bit of a trick question. They're both wrong, but it's more the one on the left. Um, so, again, it's the, the amount that you're giving. So we want to give 100 milliliters, so 100, but you need to specify the volume, so milliliters. And you're not allowed to just put ml, so you need to make sure you write milliliters out in full. So adverse drug reactions, um, so these are unwanted reactions to drugs that occur through the normal use of the drug. So it's not kind of overdose situations. These are normal levels of the drug that you would expect to give a patient and having adverse effects. They're all reported to the MHRA, um, and there's two main types. So there's type A, augmented reactions, and type B, which are idiosyncratic. They're not very useful names to think about what they are. But effectively, type A are the kind of common, predictable, and dose-dependent um, reactions that you might expect from a drug. It fits with the, path the, the, the pharmacokinetics and the, 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 the mechanism of action of that drug, such as insulin causing hyperglycemia. Um, type B are completely unlinked to the mechanism of that drug, but they are a common, um, uh, well-documented reactions. So some examples, so obviously, anticoagulates, uh, anticoagulants and bleeding, insulin causing hyperglycemia, um, antipsychotics with Parkinsonism because of the antidopaminergic effect, and then some of these kind of unexplained but very well-documented reactions such as anaphylaxis to penicillin, um, 
uh, malignant hypothermia to anaesthetics and things would be the type B reactions. So allergies are obviously a type of an adverse reaction. Um, type 1 allergy, the IgE-mediated um, allergy, is, is not as common as people report having an allergy. As I touched on in the antibiotic lecture, it's really important to try and clarify what that patient's reaction to a medication is. Um, these are kind of the true allergic symptoms, so urticaria, swelling, laryngeal edema, and then you know, full-blown anaphylactic shock. Um, they might not appear on the first administration of that drug, um, and they can get, you can have a delayed response. Um, and it can, people often get a kind of a rebound um, anaphylactoid reaction after initial presentation. And we treat that with adrenaline. So in terms of antibiotics and penicillin, which of these are safe to give, not safe to give, or you might want to just uh, be cautious in their use. So Augmentin, safe or not? No. Not safe. Amikacin? No. Safe. Keftraxone? No. Gentamicin? No. Tazacin? No. Doxycycline? No. Fluclox? No. Metronidazole? No. Trimethoprim? No. Meropenem? No. no. Caution. So, um, so these are the safe ones. These are all contain penicillins. So tazacin has piperacillin in, um, augmentin has amoxicillin. These, as you remember from the antibiotic lecture, are beta-lactam-based antibiotics, so there is a bit of a crossover. But if clinically indicated uh, and warranted, then you can use them in, with caution. There's just a ex slightly extended list of those. So a patient recently given tazacin, despite uh, a documented type 1 penicillin allergy, developed shortness of breath, stridor, and a widespread urticarial rash which are appropriate treatments. So giving him an oral dose of Pyritin. No. Adrenaline, 10 mils of 1 in 10,000 IV. No. Adrenaline, 10 mils of 1 in 10,000 IM. Oh, some more yeses there. Still some no's. Adrenaline, half a mil of 1 in 1,000 IV. No. Adrenaline, half a mil of one in a thousand IM. Yay, good. It's easy when they're all up there, isn't it? Um, hydrocortisone IV and chlorophenamine IV. We generally got the positive mutters for the correct ones there. Um, so that would be kind of your acute management of an anaphylactic reaction along with your kind of ABCD approach. Um, for those unfamiliar with kind of these ra drugs as ratios, this is effectively what it means. So it's the weight in grams versus the volume in mils. So when we're saying one in a thousand, we're saying there's one gram in a thousand mils. It's obviously the same as a thousand milligrams in a thousand mils, which is one milligram in a mil. That's used in anaphylaxis. The other one is used in cardiac arrest. The way to think about it is giving an IM injection is unpleasant. It can be painful, so you want small volumes of a high concentration of the adrenaline. And um, that's why it's a higher concentration, smaller volume. Whereas in cardiac arrest, you want to give it IV, um, and you need larger volumes to kind of flush in and get to the heart. Um, you can use IV adrenaline in this situation if you're very experienced, you've got anesthetics, and you, you know, you're really worried. But, you know, I am injection for anaphylaxis um, at our level. Other adverse reactions? So... We've got a 76-year-old on warfarin um, for recovered DVTs. Recent check showed an INR of 7. She's otherwise well, no bleeding. What would we do? Yeah, so we'd withhold the warfarin for a, a day or two, recheck the INR. Once it's back in the normal range, then we can restart. So we've got a 64-year-old on warfarin for AF. Um, recent check showed an INR of 8.4, uh, and they're suffering from a, a nosebleed. So stop the warfarin again, good. Do we need to give anything else? What could we give? Vitamin K, good. So vitamin K is an antagonist of warfarin. Nosebleed can be severe in certain situations, but if he's otherwise stable, some um, vitamin K to reverse that effect. An 83-year-old on warfarin um, for replacement heart valve. The re recent check showed an INR of 8.7. And they're suffering from an upper GI bleed. Um, and let's say they're hemodynamically compromised. What are we going to do? Yeah, 
Yeah, so exactly. So this is obviously this patient's unwell. We're going to be full ABCD approach, maybe needing to give blood if they're losing a lot of blood. Uh, but then the treatment would be, um, <coughs> have people heard of beriplex and, and octoplex, the kind of um, prothrombin complex concentrates, has all those, those cotton, clotting factors. It's important that you need to give the vitamin K as well, else the warfarin that's on board will just antagonize those clotting factors as well. Um, so these are the kind of guidelines on the management of warfarin over treatment. So there's certain high-risk patients that you will have a lower threshold for treatment. Um, <coughs> These are kind of the bleeding factors, so minor bleeding, so a bit of blood in the urine or a nosebleed, major bleeding, um, self-explanatory. As with all guidelines, they're just a guideline. Your clinical decision, your clinical um, uh, impression of that patient trumps that. It, so if you think that nosebleed is causing such a loss of blood that you do need to treat and reverse critically, you can um, do so. And the management options would be withholding the warfarin, um, vitamin K, you can give it oral or IV. The IV has a slightly quicker onset. The PCC, Beriplex Octoplex, um, is of growing use, uh, and fresh flows in plasma, plasma is similar. It's, as with all of these, you need to consider why the INR was high in the first place. Have they recently been started on another drug that might affect the warfarin um, levels? Um, and look at the drug chart and, and think about why it's high. So drug monitoring, touched on this a bit in the antibiotic lecture, will become a bane of your life as a house officer. Um, the reason we do it is that for a number of drugs, um, the therapeutic range is narrow and you don't want to get toxic effects. Um, there are other indications for it, so perhaps if you're thinking there's a compliance issue um, and you want to, to check that the patient is actually taking that medication before moving to more extreme um, uh, in management options, um, it kind of broadly categorizes judging the benefit of a medication as well. So, for example, kind of hypothyroidism, you're giving levothyroxine, there will be some symptomatic benefit, but by monitoring the TFTs and things, you'll be able to get a parameter of the, your, your, the drug you're giving and whether you need to increase or decrease the dose. Um, and for all of these kind of active medication levels, you're going to be needing to take it once a steady state is achieved. I won't go back to the pharmacokinetics and pharmadynamics, um, but generally after three or five doses, that patient will be in a steady state for that medication, and at that point you can take the level. There's a, a list of commonly measured medications and when you would do them. If you got this in your exam, you're going to get this information. They're going to give you a graph or, or the you know, the levels that you need and if it's a trough or peak level and kind of what you would want to do. It will be just data interpretation for you, um, which I'm sure um, you'll be able to manage. And here's some other situations. Drug interactions, lots of different effects. I won't go through all of these. The worst one that we all worry about is the enzyme induction and inhibition. Um, we have a hepatologist in the room, so I'm going <laughs> to not comment too much on these. Um, I haven't yet found a very nice way of trying to remember what all these medications are. You just kind of have to sit down and remember them. In my attempt to find, I came across these really weird cartoons that someone has drawn, um, which tries to either categorize them as kind of fast, like carbamazepine and rifampicin and things that induce enzymes, and things that are cold and slow, like isoniazid and cementidine and things. <laughs> I'm not sure it would have helped me when I was revising, but if it helps you, feel free to use them. So I'm really aware we're, we're running slightly behind. I just whizzed through for five minutes. I just want you to shout out nice and quickly what is wrong with these medication shouts. Nice and loud. So he's allergic to codeine, but he's given cocodamol. Obvious error. Other things? There's no reaction, so it's good practice to actually write what that reaction is. There's no hospital number, so there might be lots of Malcolm Fishers. It goes with the Will's talk on blood transfusion about checking that patient's name and checking, you know, the spelling things. I think there was a study done at Whips Cross for blood transfusion, and at any one time there was um, kind of like 15 Mohammeds with the same first name, same surname. There was five of them with the same date of birth. So, you know, patient details 
are really important, uh, including hospital numbers, NHS numbers. Um, it's not actually signed for, it's not a valid prescription. And these things are kind of good practice. How could you alter this prescription to be kinder? To so bring in them both to the morning, because else he's going to be up all night peeing, or he's going to be up all night because the natural peak and um, steroids are at kind of 9 a.m. in the morning, so if you give it at night, um, they'll have trouble sleeping. So that's just a sympathetic thing to do. So back to warfarin. So these are the nice little things that they have in Bart's Health. It literally explains to you completely what you should give. So does that come across clearly? What dose would we give this patient? So we're initiating them on warfarin. So we just follow this little guide at the bottom. So day one, two, what doses we give. Day three, we check the INR. It's 2.8. We look down here, 2.6 to 2.9, we can give three milligrams. So you've prescribed three milligrams there. Anything above that, you use this bit. It's just a guide. If someone's coming into you on a care of the elderly ward, they've been on it for years, they'll have their yellow book. They've always been on one or two milligrams a day. And you, just, you can continue with that. Thinking about, though, have they been started on any new medications in A&E, um, clarithromycin or things that are going to completely affect their warfarin levels and just monitor it a bit more closely. What are the mistakes here? So with this one. Yep, so this actually says MG, so it's just completely incorrect dosing. Um, so it should be micrograms for digoxin. That comment goes down here for levothyroxine, that you should write out micrograms in full. And insulin, a lot of hospitals now are bringing in specific places for insulin on drug charts to try and avoid these errors. You should always write units out in full. It's not unreasonable to think that says 120 and 160 units. And there are people with very... Um, you know, bad type 2 diabetes that are on doses of, you know, 50 units and things. So it's not completely unreasonable to think that that might be what is prescribed. So always um, write out units in full. What would we want to monitor in this patient? Absolutely, potassium. So the spironolactone is obviously potassium sparing diuretic. Ramipril also increases the levels of potassium. And there's another big list of all the things that cause increased potassium. <coughs> what is this patient at risk of? Oh no, they both affect enzymes. So this is a really difficult question. I don't think you'd get something this hard because they both affect um, cytochrome enzymes. Um, one's an enzyme inhibitor, one's an enzyme inducer, but it's less so so uh, they would be at risk of phenytoin toxicity. That's a tough question, but it would not be unreasonable to get a question like that, thinking about phenytoin and things. Is this, this is a, another difficult one. What would this person be at risk of? So these cause hyponatremia, quite a common thing that you see in hospitals. It's, Really complex thing to try and work out what causes the hyponatremia. Dehydration can cause it. Overhydration can cause it. What, you know, what is it? As with all things, look at the drug chart first. Have they been started on these medications recently? It could be their cause. Quickly whiz through these errors. First one. I heard it over there, so you can't give this level of potassium stat, so you'll probably put them into a VF arrest. So the most I think you can give is 10 millimoles of potassium per hour. Um, so never prescribe that. This one, hot off the press from last lecture. So there's a couple, yeah. So the four hours, you should think about writing it for less time just to, to take account for the logistics. And also one on each separate line. You know, the number of checks that you have to do for that blood, you need to be able to write clearly what blood that was and when it started and when it didn't. Um, and if you're trying to squeeze it all in, um, it's unsafe. And this one? It's too much sugar. It's too much sugar, yeah. So 50% dextrose is a really irritant um, fluid. You'd only give it in small aliquots in a, a, you know, emergency hyperglycemia. 
in quite rare instances, ideally you'd opt for 20 to 10% dextrose. Maybe this person was trying to write 5% dextrose, um, so never use 50% dextrose as a maintenance fluid. Good. So that was really quick just to try and get through. These are all of the kind of theory slides that I've put in about prescribing in liver disease, common culprits, things to consider and monitor, similar things for renal disease, um, common things, prescribing in pregnancy and breastfeeding. These are all things that you might get quizzed on, um, but the theory is there. I'm not just going to go read through the slides. Um, this has, if you haven't seen this, this is basically a complete outline of your prescribing exam. All the kind of common topics that they might ask you on. I found it at this um, link. I've just realized there's a date there, so it might be out of date, but you could change that to 2015, 2016. I'll check and update the slides as necessary. But that is basically the things you need to know. There are some free um, practice papers out there and things for you to do if you're bored tomorrow. Um, but there's lots of information out there, and I think there's a growing... PSA was really new when I, when I did it. Um, but I think there's growing resources out there for you to use. Um, and that's what we've covered. So let's take a um, five-minute break. Please be back at quarter past seven. I'll be around if you have any specific questions on that. And uh, we'll come back for Simply Gastro.